Hello, my friend, and welcome back to a brand new episode of Catching Your Breath, the podcast. I'm Steve Austin, your host, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to spend a little time with me. This is one of the most powerful conversations on shame I've ever been privileged to have with another person. So I put out a call on social media a few weeks ago, inviting those of you who would be interested in a free coaching session with me and also willing to let me record it uh, to reach out. And uh, this person reached out and we're withholding her name um, because that's her choice and because she shared a lot of deeply personal details in this conversation. But as you listen, if you think, man, I'd love to do some of that healing work. I'd love to do some of that deep, meaningful inner work with Steve. Then reach out and let me know. I have 11 more of those free slots available. Send me a message, steve at iamsteveaustin.com, and we will make it happen. Okay, let's dive right in to this conversation. I'm so glad you're here. I guess it's, it started, I was 23 okay. years old, and I had um, gotten a new job at mm -hmm. this um, financial institution, and I was just out of a relationship I had just broken up with a fiance that was in another state. Okay. And um, I met a person who was, I guess, one of my superiors at the time. I was doing all kinds of personal banking and selling investments, and he was like the investment side okay. person. And I just, everything just happened really fast. And I, I know I was in kind of a vulnerable position, and I just found myself wrapped up in this relationship that I knew at my core was something that was completely against the values that I had, and yet there I was. So for the next seven years, I was in this relationship, and it was really... Um, just emotionally and physically damaging. And, you know, there were all the, it was the classic, you know, affair type of relationship with everything that, oh, you know, I'm going to leave. Oh, you know, it's complicated right now. And, yeah. and there was just so much that by the end of it, by the time that I left when I was 30, 30, 31, I was completely just destroyed pretty much with, yeah. with the anger of, you know, when you finally reach that breaking point, Yep. I had finally just looked back at all of the seven years and I was some, I don't know, I, I think, you know, I, God just got in my head and was like, okay, are you ready to listen? Cause through that time there were always little things mm -hmm. that I felt were tugging at me because I just knew it was, it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong, but then there were always just be that desire to be loved, you know, that because I didn't have that growing up mm -hmm. and I didn't have it in my first marriage, which was physically abusive. So I just would override that voice in, in my head and say, okay, no, I'm going to stay here because this is something I can see. This is something I can feel even if, you know, it hurts, but I'm used to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was used to love hurting and that's all that I knew Friend, I know we're just barely into this conversation, but I have to pause for a minute and ask you, do you know what that feels like? Do you know what it's like for love to only hurt? If so, I want to tell you about this brand new video-based course I've just released, Emotional Health 101, 30 Days of Well-Being. You can get all the information by going to IamSteveAustin.podia.com. That's IamSteveAustin.podia.com. If you feel stuck 
If you have been wounded and you want to heal, check out this course today. All right, let's get back into this conversation. But after a while, just the shame of, yeah. of being in that, after I kind of woke up, then that's when that shame came in. And just how could you allow yourself to do, to do this? How could you get involved with something like this that hurt so many other people? Mm. You know, it was, it just got to be a lot. It got to be so much. And the way I just kind of broke it suddenly, I didn't heal from it. I just completely broke it, then moved completely into something else. And I buried it for a ton of years, almost two decades until I ran into the person from afar. And when I saw his face, everything oh, came back yeah. and it was just, it was like the floodgates opening and I was right back in that spot. That's heavy. Mm. Yeah. That's really heavy. Yeah. Yeah, boy, that uh, there are things that trigger me from my abuse, which was 33 years ago now. Um, and still little things will trigger those memories. And it is, that's hell. That's, it's awful. It, it really is. And it kind of affected I mean, it just affects everything because there were some mm -hmm. years where, because I'm remarried now, I've, I've had another mm -hmm. child, I'm actually in a happy and healthy relationship, Good. but I still find that the shame over this and the trauma over this thing that happened in the past, it still affects what's going on with me today because of How some of the How does triggers. that play out? Trust. A lot of okay. times, trust issues. I okay. think um, when I turned, I guess, the age that my ex-partner's wife was when mm. we met up, all of a sudden, things that were told to me back then about her, I saw differently being this woman, this 40, you know, three year old woman and what we go through with perimenopause and, you know, things like that. And it just started to make me think, well, a reasonable spouse would have been fine with that and not went for someone 20 years younger. So then I just started freaking out and I started panicking and I started looking at my husband and thinking, okay, you know, everything that goes through your mind, okay, karma, because everyone tells you when you're involved in a relationship like that, karma is going to get you. Sure. So I started just being very untrusting of my husband for no reason mm -hmm. other than waiting for the karma to come and yeah. get me. Wow. So that is definitely shame. Um, Brene Brown talks about that, you know, just waiting for the next shoe to drop. It's like, oh, it's my turn now. This is now this is going to bite me. Uh, things can't be this good. Surely I don't deserve this marriage, this healthy relationship. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. All mm -hmm. of that because, you know, well, yeah, look at what you did to someone else mm -hmm. and their relationship. What, what do you think? You think that's just going to go unpunished because from my upbringing, punishment was big as yeah. well. And the, the fire and brimstone God mm -hmm. was very big in my upbringing as well. Who is God to you today? Wow. God is an understanding caretaker mm. is how I see God right now. I have to be honest and say I still struggle with the father concept around God because of the abuse that I suffered in my childhood. So I just have to kind of see that a little differently. I can accept, you know, this, just the spirit, mm -hmm. you know, the spirit of God. I know for a lot of people, you know, the father and the mother thing, it, it helps them if they had the good father mother relationship mm -hmm. so yeah how much more will he give but for someone like me who really didn't have that yeah just being i i'm cool with the knowledge of the spirit of okay God. 
side piece, home wrecker, mistress. What does the understanding caregiver call you? Child. What does the understanding caregiver do with or say to that child who's feeling ashamed? That nothing is unforgivable. Hmm. That even the ugliest of things are lessons that, and that knowledge can be used for good. And there's nothing that I can do to separate him from me. So that would be a great conversation if we just stopped there. At least that's the way I was raised in Christian circles. Let us hear what God would say to us. Let us pray about it. Let us give our shame to God. And most of the time we stop short. We stop right there because most of us have been raised in this faith or therapy thing, faith or science, Christianity or mental health. But I'm about to take this conversation to the next step. Yes, give your shame to God. Yes, ask God what he says and thinks of you. And let's take some practical steps to rewire your brain, to work through those thought patterns, to imagine what wholeness might look like. Let's take some practical steps to get there. So that's what we're going to do now. Join me. curious a few things um when you when you're really feeling that shame and it's telling you what a terrible horrible no good very bad girl you are (laughs) where do you do you feel it in your body does it show up for you somewhere oh yeah it shows up for me physically in in my chest Mm -hmm. It shows up for me, um, in my shoulders. I get, I get very tense. My stomach Mm -hmm. gets very knotted and there's just kind of a lump in the back of my throat. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of feel like I want to go into the corner. Like I did when I was a little girl and I got in trouble. I would just go in the corner and Mm -hmm. just cry and be by myself and that's that's kind of how it that's how it feels that's how it shows up for me physically i withdraw so for a while i withdrew from you know my family and my husband and they're like what's going on and i was like i'm just going through some stuff you know, i just withdrew when i think back on my own shame um and mine was the shame of the abuse as a preschooler and yeah, that's exactly how it happens for me too. I shrink. I want to disappear. I want to just get as tiny and a tight little ball as I can. Um, even now, isn't that, it's fascinating. It's, it's horrifying and it's fascinating to me how, man, shame has such power over us when we let it, when it, when it goes unfaced, untreated, unspoken. Yeah, I Powerful. I definitely think it's the it's the unspoken because it's almost like everything is compartmentalized mm-hmm. because I have actually spoken in public about my physical abuse that I suffered as a child. Mm-hmm. I spoke about it. It's been published in magazines. Mm-hmm. I've written about it. Mm-hmm. I've done multiple interviews about it. I can talk about that. 
Mm-hmm. I can talk about the domestic violence that I experienced in my first marriage. But when it comes to this, I don't speak about it. Because those things happen to you. And this, you can connect and say, well, I made this choice. You know, right? Do you, oh, yeah. do you feel that? Yeah. 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 You know what? I never. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was abused. In my first relationship, I didn't ask for that. I was abused as a child by people who knew better and were bigger and stronger and more powerful than me. And I didn't ask for that. But this got a little twisted because I got interested in this guy and then it became this whole thing that I never intended. Yeah. 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 And even though, you know, and I know knowledge, okay, I was not, I was an unhealed person dealing with Sure. You know, a variety. I logically, I knew all of yes. this, but mm-hmm. there's still, you know, what people, you know, oh, the side chick and mm. the home wrecker and all of the words that someone gets called. I was calling myself. Part of the reason why I stayed in it for so long mm-hmm. was because I was desperately trying to change that narrative. Okay. I want to do a little exercise because shame is such a, especially when you've got it from childhood, you've got it from a previous marriage, you've got it from a previous other relationship. When you've got that much compounded, we're never going to heal it in a 45 minute phone call, Mm -hmm. but, but there are pieces that we can do. You know, we could, my gosh, this could be drawn out into a series, but there are, There's a thing we can do. So what I want to do today, if it's okay with you, I want to look at um, challenging your negative thoughts. So the negative thoughts come. We're human. The negative thoughts are going to come from now till you are 99. You know, they're going to be there. Um, I heard it explain my friend Sue, and I know she got this somewhere else, but but it, it helped me. She said, what do your lungs need to operate? Well, oxygen, yeah, right. you know, what, what does your heart need to function? Blood. Mm-hmm. What does your brain need to function? Thoughts. We, we feed our brain thoughts. It's got, it's constantly thinking of something. And so then you get into the old analogy of the two dogs. You got two dogs in that fight and whichever dog you feed is the dog that's going to win. And so are you feeding that positive, healthy, whole dog? <laughs> or are you feeding that negative, shameful, hate-filled, judgmental, critical, you are a piece of, you know, dog? Um, so that being said, I want to look at our thoughts. The goal with this is to, number one, is to acknowledge Ooh, I'm having that negative thought. The, the negative thought comes in for me. Uh, I'm a home wrecker. I'm nothing but a home wrecker. That's what it says. I'm nothing but a home wrecker. I'm always going to be a home wrecker. I've always been a home wrecker, right? Because that's how shame works in those always and nevers, all those extremes. Right. So that thought comes in and I go, Ooh, there's that thought. All right. My first question when that thought comes in is, is this true? Is this thought true? And when you can say no, even if you don't believe it yet, even if you go, well, maybe I kind of, you know, well, it's not. And we know it's not true. Today, you are not a home wrecker. So is this thought true? Yes or no? No, it's not. Okay. Then what is true? So you got to replace that lie with the truth. I mean, I could preach about this, but you got to replace that lie with the truth. So what is true about you? I am a child of an understanding caregiver. I am happily married. I'm a good mom. And you start filling in those blanks with who I am. Right. Right. Now, the, the next question is, the last question is, what am I going to do about this? So acknowledge the thought. Is it true? When you can get to the place where you say, no, it's not true. What is true? 
And then what am I going to do about it? And the what I'm what am I going to do about it piece is I'm going to call my best friend, my ride or die homie, who I'm who's going to take this to the grave. And I'm going to confess that I'm having these thoughts and they love me enough. They're going to tell me the truth about who I am. Or I'm going to call my therapist or I'm going to get on a call with Steve or I'm going to call my pastor. I'm going to go to confession, whatever that is for you. But you that whoever said confession is good for the soul was right. So so that what am I going to do about it? Peace usually involves involving someone else. Um, if you're not ready to get to that point yet, I don't want to talk to my husband about these thoughts I'm having. OK, all right. Don't don't force yourself when you're not ready. Maybe it is writing it all down and having what I call a soul dump and just putting it all on paper and then burning that sucker. <laughs> Put it in a metal trash can in the backyard and burn it or shred it, you know, whatever you got to do. But just to get it out of your body, out of your brain, out of you, let all that energy flow out of that hand and write it down. Don't type it out, write it down on paper and then destroy it. Okay. It can be really helpful. But that process Here's the thought I'm thinking. Is this true? No. What is true? What am I going to do about it? Is a really great first step. Let me ask you this. I would love to do one more exercise. Do you have time? Yes. Yes. Um, can you get a piece of paper and a pen? Got it. Perfect. I Have you ever done um, any work with your inner critic? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're going to draw out your gremlin. Um, your gremlin is your inner critic. It is the voice of shame. It is, it's the voice that tells you all those terrible, horrible things about yourself. It's never kind. And... It initially, so a lot of people have this, this thought that shame is always bad or that the inner critic is always bad. And that's not true. In the beginning, <laughs> in our, in our lizard brain, way back when you could get kicked out of a community for making a bad choice. And when getting kicked out of your community was the end and you'd be mauled by a lion. <laughs> right. Now you get kicked out of your community. Okay. You can find a new church. You can remarry. You can get a new job. You know, you get kicked out of communities. It still hurts, but it's most of the time, not the end of the world. Back then you do something really shameful and you're going to get the boot. And so that it's there as a stop. It's there to say, whoa, whoa, whoa I better not do that. I'm going to I'm going to lose everything familiar and I'm going to be in real danger. So that carried over to now, now the inner critic, when you're healthy, the inner critic says, Hey, Hey, that's mm -mm, mm -mm, let's not do that. But when we're unhealthy, it says you piece of crap, you, you terrible, horrible, no good person. So I want you to take a minute and think about that voice, that inner critic that lives in you, that, that you hear those voices, um, and draw it out. I want to know what that inner critic looks like. I'm going to scroll up on this worksheet. I'm going to send you this after our call as well, but here's some ideas to sort of help you visualize. If you go, Oh, what does my inner critic look like? And, you, and for a lot of people, it looks like somebody in their family tree. Um, for other people, it's a blob, you know, but you take a minute and, and sketch out what you think that inner critic might look like. What do you got? It is a... kind of a, a black shape. Okay. And inside of the shape is a broken heart with a gun shooting bullets. And on the other side is the, you know, like the, the scales of justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what it is. That's heavy. What does it mean to you? Um, it means that it it's kind of my view of or the my inner critic's view of getting justice or me facing justice mm. and the broken heart with with the uh bullets is you know maybe the shots that I have taken at the innocent people in you know, in my life in that, that were innocent in the relationship that I was in and, or even now just taking the shots at the innocent people and with the heart not being whole, the heart having the jagged, you know, through it. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not a whole heart. It's not a healed heart. I find it fascinating that you're able to verbalize. Here's what I heard you verbalizing the tension between the justice you want and what shame tells you is the justice that is coming for you. That's a lot of tension. That's, that's really heavy. Um, and you stated it more eloquently than I did. So what do you think this gremlin or this inner critic, um, this broken heart with the bullets and the gun and the scales, what do you think its purpose is in your life for you specifically? What do you think it's trying to achieve? I think it's always trying to remind me of just the ugly part. Okay. The ugly part of me. It's, or the, the ugly part of, you know, my, my past and, and my life. Like it's, it's always there kind of to, to pop up when things are going good, when I'm on a roll, when, um, I finally think that I'm ready maybe to step out and, do some healing work with others, then here it comes Mm -hmm. to remind me, Oh, really? Well, you Mm -hmm. know what people are going to say. Yeah. I mean, you know what, you know, what's going to happen. Are you, you know, can you, you can't even handle that. What do you think your gremlins most afraid of? Grace. (laughs) And mercy. Mm, Yeah. Are those two of the hardest things for you to give yourself? Very hard to give myself. Very easy to give to others. Mm -hmm. Very. That's how it works, my friend. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Very easy to to, to give to others. Mm -hmm. I've talked to, you know, people have come to me with stories similar to mine and I'm able to offer that comfort and grace because I know what it feels like but when it comes to me um and myself yeah there are the times when there there it comes there's not an iota of (laughs) grace or mercy to be found when yeah the gremlin comes Mm -hmm. comes along Can we do a quick visualization exercise before I let you go? Sure. Okay. It's going to be most effective, more than likely, if you close your eyes. Let's take a couple of deep breaths before we get started. We'll breathe in. Let's breathe in again. Another big, deep breath. Okay, if you feel safe and healthy, if this is okay with you, I'd like for you to visualize that inner critic. Pull it up in your mind's eye. 
Okay. And I want to know where it is in space. Is it in your body? Is it out in front of you? Where do you sense that inner critic right now? It's in front of my face. In front of your face. Okay. About how big is it? It's about the size of my whole face okay. down to maybe mid waist. And it's just right up in my face, like okay. pointing. Okay. What's it? It's pointing. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's very pointing. accusatory. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to invite you to have a conversation with that inner critic and it can feel awkward at first. Um, but this can be really therapeutic if you allow yourself to just kind of let go for a minute. You mentioned that your inner critic is most afraid of mercy and grace. And what I know about the inner critic is that it is rooted in fear, shame, and guilt. That's how it gets you to shrink. That's how it gets you to not step into your power, to not level up and help others. That's, that's, that's what it does. Um, it is also rooted in the superego. It's rooted in the, the big I. It's all about me. And the other thing I know is it feels deeply responsible to protect you. So it it is keeping you small. It is making you curl into a ball like a turtle going into its shell to keep you from getting hurt again. And in doing so, it's hurting you. Okay. So I'd love for you to have a conversation out loud or in your head with this inner critic and let it know that you are okay, that you are safe. You can even thank it for trying to protect you when you were a child. And then you can let it know that you're no longer a child, that you can do this, that you've got this, and you can give it permission to take a break. Okay, Gremlin. I... I know you're scary to me at times, and I know that you're trying to help, and you're trying to protect me from everything, but you're causing me damage. You're not suiting me any longer it's too hard it's not the right way to heal so you can take time off <laughs> take a vacation fly away I'm okay I have other ways I can heal I have grace, I have mercy, I have forgiveness. I don't need it. I don't need you anymore. And I think it's really important because this is a piece of you to let that inner critic know, I'm not trying to destroy you. I'm not trying to obliterate you. There are parts of you that are helpful but I'd like to ask your permission to let me get into the driver's seat for a while. So I thank you for doing what, what you thought was best at the time mm. to keep me alive, to keep me safe. But now I'm ready to take the reins 
So I'd like for you to have a seat for a while. I can do it. I'm okay. How do you feel right now? A little bit like a weight's been lifted and a little exhausted at the same time and a little scared. Scared of what? Scared of fully taking the reins. Mm -hmm. Scared of fully, um, of what will happen if I just fully take it and tell the inner critic to hush. Mm. Yeah. Because it's been with me for so long. So I think that's okay. I think it's, it's like that baby bird getting ready to <laughs> jump out of the nest for the very first time. My advice, give yourself a whole lot of mercy, a whole lot of grace. Um, know that the inner critic's going to rear its head again. That gremlin's going to show back up and it, it, you know, it hopefully has shrunk down a little bit right now and it's not as big as your face and half your body. Hopefully it's a little smaller. It's yeah. going to try to stretch out of that a little bit. And this is a practice. It's a process. Lots of grace, lots of mercy, lots of patience. You know, we talk in recovery work about how relapse is a part of recovery. And so relapsing into those shameful thoughts, relapsing into those negative thoughts, it's part of the process. But you got tools. You've got that understanding caregiver. You got me. You can call me, email me. Page me. <laughs> this was big work today. This is, Brene Brown would call this a vulnerability hangover. That's what you're feeling right now. Yeah. That's what you're feeling right now. This was good. This was, uh, this was a, a heavy conversation. I hope it was helpful for you. Oh, it was very much. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Oh, my friend, thank you so much for joining me today. This was such a powerful conversation. I am so grateful. Again, if you're interested in having a similar conversation about whatever inside of you needs to heal, I would be honored to share that conversation right here on the podcast and give you a free coaching session. Two other things I'd like to mention real quick. If you haven't checked out my Patreon page lately, I've just recently updated the reward tiers and all the different ways that you can get involved and get bonus content from coaching resources directly from my library to a community call to one-on-one -on -one sessions with me. You can get all that at patreon.com slash I am Steve Austin. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash I am Steve Austin. And if you haven't joined us on Facebook, you can join the Facebook community for free right now. If you go to Facebook and search Catching Your Breath, you'll see the Catching Your Breath community right there. It's a safe place where you can find support for your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And finally, if you haven't left a rating and review on iTunes, would you please, please, please do that? It helps so much. If you don't have money to support my work through Patreon, you could really support me by just leaving a review on iTunes and letting other people know what this show and these conversations mean to you. All right, my friend, for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you and give you peace. I'll see you soon.